In this video, we will go through differential gene expression analysis. From the biological and experimental motivation perfor for performing this analysis, statistical tests, and ways to begin analyzing your results. First, we'll go through what questions you might answer by studying differential gene expression. Then we'll go into the statistics of identifying which genes are differentially expressed. Lastly, we'll go through how you can begin to interpret the output of this analysis. Differential expression has become popular with the development of microarray technology. In these experiments, RNA transcript levels are determined by hybridization to a microarray of short DNA probes. Genes are represented by 10 to 20 probes on the array. From the signal intensities of these spots on the array, the expression level of the gene can be determined. But these values aren't particularly interesting on their own. It is most interesting to look at differences between the expression levels in different samples. One possible comparison is between diseased and normal tissues. For example, in this paper, differentially expressed genes in ovarian tumors compared to normal epithelium were identified. These can be used either as diagnostic biomarkers or to identify pathways to drug target. Another example is in comparing different types of diseased tissues, such as different breast cancers in this paper. This can aid in classifying disease subtypes and to identify drugs that could, be specifically, that could specifically target pathways involved in certain subtypes of the disease. Another example is in looking at transcriptional responses to drug treatments, such as the response to liposomal cisplatin in ovarian cancer in this paper. This can help identify how a drug treatment is working and help in studying mechanisms of drug resistance. One important aspect of experimental design in all of these types of experiments is the inclusion of biological replicates. We want to be confident that the genes we identify are really differentially expressed. Biological replicates are samples from different patients or animals or cell culture plates. They help show the normal variation between samples of the same type, either due to biological noise or noise from experimental differences. This allows you to see if the difference between sample types is greater than the normal variance between experimental replicates. So after obtaining the microarray data, how can we tell that whether two genes expression level levels are different or not? Here I'll introduce four significance tests that might help solve this problem. Suppose that there are two sample groups, X and Y, and the tests that can be used here can be divided into two categories, the parametric tests and the non-parametric tests. Parametric tests like two-sample t-test and Walsh t-test assume that the data follows a normal distribution, while the non-parametric tests like permutation tests and Mount Whitney U test hold no assumption of the data's distribution pattern. The two-sample t-tests non-hypothesis is that the means of the two groups are the same. The stat unit used in it is the t-statistic, whose formula is shown on the slide. After getting the t-value and the degree of freedom, you can simply compare them with the values given in the standard t-table, and accordingly accept or reject the null hypothesis. The Walsh t-test is somewhat similar with the two-sample t-test. The only difference is that the assumption of Walsh t-test allows variances of the two groups to be different, and hence they must be estimated separately. Now let's take a look at two non-parametric -par tests. The first one is permutation t-test. Permutation t-test employs a method called resembling. Namely, it exchanges labels on data points when performing significance tests. And the rationale behind it is that the labels are exchangeable under the null hypothesis. If the labels are exchangeable under the null hypothesis, then the resulting tests should yield exact significance level. The last test that we are going to look at is Mount Whitney U test. It arranges the combined set of data in ascending order and then gives each data point a rank equal to the average position of them in order sequence. And then by combining the sum of the ranks and the sizes of the samples, we can calculate the u-statistic, which can then be used to help deciding on whether or not to accept the null hypothesis. After performing these statistical tests, it's important to correct for multiple hypothesis testing. 
When you're testing so many genes for differential expression, even at a small p-value for an individual test, you will still falsely call many genes differentially expressed. So the strategy is to define a false positive rate, which is how many of the genes that you call differentially expressed are not actually differentially expressed. One method for doing this correction is called the benjamini hochberg method. It helps you choose how many genes to call significantly differentially expressed. You use the equation p is less than or equal to x times alpha over m, where p is the largest p-value that you'll call significant. Alpha is the false discovery rate that you want to achieve, such as 5%. x is the number of genes that you'll call significant, and m is the total number of hypotheses tested, i.e. the number of genes. Once we do the statistical analysis on differential expression from the microarray data, we'll get this list of significantly upregulated or downregulated genes. However, with no context, these genes will not be interesting to the scientific community. We need to know what this list of genes tells us. To understand a little more of the biological context and significance of these genes, we need to look at gene ontology. Gene ontology, or GO, is a controlled vocabulary of terms for describing gene product characteristics and annotation data. GO gives us a standardized vocabulary of genes and their functions so that we can make meaningful observations about them. There are three domains that GO covers. One is cellular component, like the parts of a cell or its extracellular environment. This includes structures of the cell, like a nucleus or endoplasmic reticulum, or a gene product group like the ribosome. Another domain is molecular function, which describes what the gene does, like being a transporter or a transcription factor. The last domain is biological process, which is how the gene is involved in the functioning of cells, tissues, or organisms. This can be as broad as signal transduction or as specific as alpha-glucoside transport. Go terms form a directed acyclic graph, where each term has defined relationships to other terms. Each term describes a normal function of that gene. So that means that oncogenesis is not a Go term because cancer is not a normal product of a gene. Go is species neutral, so a term can be used for any organism. It's applicable to prokaryotes, eukaryotes, single cell, and multicellular organisms. There are a few online tools where you can find out more about the gene ontology of your genes. The gene ontology website, www.geneontology.org, is a good place to start. Now we already knew how to classify the samples. But to do this, we have to know which sample are cancer, which are control. Or we have to know the information about the genes from the gene ontology data. Now let's imagine one situation. We know nothing about genes or samples. But could we still get some information? For example, do we know which genes have similar expression patterns? Yes, that's exactly what clustering could tell us. Intuitively, clustering is to put similar items in one group and to separate different items into different groups. To achieve this, for example, we have 100 samples and their corresponding microarray. Then, according to the microarray information, we can assign a position for each sample in a virtual space and then to calculate the distance between each pair of samples. And then we could find their similarity. Two major ways to do clustering, hierarchical and partitional. The philosophy between two of them are different. Hierarchical clustering will tend to assume there always exists some degree of similarity. So it will preserve the connectivity but in the contrast, partitional clustering will try to set up a clear cutoff into either similar or not similar. So it will create mutual exclusive groups. And we can apply these two methods in our microarray data and get some interesting results. To summary, in this video, we review some important ideas in gene inspiration analysis. By t-test, by gene set arrangement, we need to know the differential expression genes in our data. Or, we could use the clustering to find in interesting information in our data. Thanks for your, for your attention.